Uh, Jack has been mostly retired since 2017. However, Jack's version of retirement and everybody else's is slightly different. He was a national biologist and director of conservation and ecology for Trouts Unlimited Canada. And another 50 years of fly fishing and fly tying and has spanned Canada, the USA and Argentina. So we're very fortunate to have Jack. Thank you very much, Brian. And thank you, David and everybody at the Walton Club for inviting me to do another little talk today. Um, I'll, I'll start right away by just getting my screen up and running. And uh, okay, I don't think you need to see me, uh, but, uh, but anyway, so, the topic that I chose was uh, to talk a little bit about the status and restoration of brook trout in Ontario. My talk today will be to sort of give you an overview of what's happening with brook trout in Ontario, now, both southern and northern, although I'll speak more directly about southern Ontario, and talk a little bit about the factors affecting their loss, because we have lost a lot of brook trout populations and streams. Things that have been done, uh, the tools that we, are that we are developing to try to offset those losses and try to look at restoration work. And then finish off with um, a question about who's mining the store and what do we need to do in order to, to stop the decline? And, and where do we go from moving forward? First of all, you know, the book trial were doing perfectly fine <laughs> before we came along. And uh, so the challenge, of, uh, as always is, uh, we've met the enemy and he is us. And in many cases, it's our mismanagement of landscapes and our different priorities that have affected not only the brook trout, but the quality of the water, the quality of our lakes, and the quality of our streams. And we do know better. Uh, those that know me know I love this, um, this, uh, this old um, cartoon. It's from the Carling Conservation Digest from 1947. And it's uh, basically, it's there to tell us that we know better. So it talks about a young lad in 1872 and beautiful streams that hadn't been altered too much yet, catching a pile of brook trout. And there's little critters everywhere. Birds are flying, fish are jumping. The river is tight and clean and cool. And that same little young man is now an old codger in 47 talking to his grandson saying, when I was your age, William, a sparkling stream flowed here. What you see has, has resulted from the destruction of the forests and the swamps. So basically, it's telling us there are consequences to our actions on the land and it affects our water. So my brook trout, well, first of all, there's only one native um, inland trout species in eastern North America, and that's the brook trout. There are other species of salmonids that were found in eastern North America. There was the lake trout in our lakes and in Lake Ontario, uh, landlocked Atlantic salmon, and that's it. And be honest with you, brook trout are uh, the two trout species we think of, but we're not even trout to begin with. They're both members of the Arctic char family. That's why they're Salvolinus fontanellus and not Oncorhynchus or Salmo. So brook trout are very special. They're the brook trout of the cold little springs. Um, the, uh, the Salvolinus fontanellus means the springs cold springs. The requirements that therefore are very cold water temperatures, gently flowing uh, flow volumes, lots of food, lots of habitat, cover, and areas to reproduce. And all of this is hinged upon groundwater, which means it's ultimately hinged on how healthy the surrounding land is. It's not just about water. The water starts, comes from the sky. Much of it comes in contact with the land first, goes over and through the land, and then comes into our river, the, these rivers and streams. And that is a critical component to making cold, clean water, which people will seem to like too. Brook trout therefore require these groundwater seeps in order to spawn successfully. And that potential of volume is ultimately controlled by the local geology. The bottom line is that when brook trout begin to disappear, your water resources, drinking water, uh, a river flowing water, the health of that water, its clarity and cleanliness are also sick. Brook trout, therefore, are simply indicators of watershed health and are indicators of whether we have sound management or not. And that is part of the key. And this is when you're talking to friends of yours that don't like, uh, don't care about fishing, 
they should care about brook trout disappearing in their local water courses because it's telling them that the land is being mismanaged, which means it'll affect them too, whether they fish or not. So, oh, about uh, five years ago now, a bunch of us pushed for and had the province agreed to uh, hold a major science and management synthesis focusing on the role status of brook trout populations in Ontario and also to determine what we should do about it. So for those that, uh, that look at their fishing regs once in a while, you'll notice that we have something called fishery management zones, FMZs. And primarily brook trout populations are predominantly found in FMZ 6, 7, 8, 10, 15, and 16. 15 is Eastern Southern Ontario, 16 is Southern, South Central, Southwestern Ontario. And the other zones are North of Superior, Algonquin, and up around Nipigon. One of the things we did is we had all the biologists who are still remaining in government, and then others that also worked in fisheries, to go back and look at all the historical records they could find for their, their area, and to look at historical distribution of brook trout populations versus what they saw as of 2017. This is the result. We've lost 20% of our brook trout populations in Northern Ontario and over 80% in Southern Ontario in the last 100 years. And I would su uh, suggest to you that the vast majority of that loss has occurred in the last 60 years. So we're still losing them. And then the question is why the losses, especially in fishery management zones 15 and 16? And let's explore that. We'll start by looking at the north. So major drivers of brook trout population losses in Northern Ontario have been historical traditional timber harvest practices. Uh, those, some of those have been improved quite a bit, but a lot of, they have to build roads in to get that, that lumber. A lot of those roads uh, had, poor, uh, had poorly designed culverts that which lost the, which prevented the animals from moving up and down small streams, created blockages, so to speak. A lot of the, the those uh, roads then become conduits for sediment and flush sediment in the local creeks, which fill them in or fill in lakes, uh, lake bottoms with um, heavy sediment loads and spawning areas. Mining, of course, creates acid uh, mine tailing issues as well as physical disruption. And then we have major highway and rail corridors, which again, create connectivity issues. And of course, because Northern Ontario has lots of waterfalls and high gradient streams, we have hydroelectric production, which creates large dams that also prevent movement of, uh, of these animals, control discharges and moderate flood flows and, high and low flows. And then finally, as well, there's over harvest. So these are all the major drivers that have affected Northern Ontario stream. So what are the mechanisms? Well, first of all, loss of connectivity means, simply means culverts that are perched and, and uh, set up kind of high, which prevent the animals from moving up and down the system. Uh, they pre prevent them not only from getting to critical habitats like spawning areas. So for example, if you're a coaster brook trout and, and you um, live on a stream that runs along Highway 17, which is a major highway corridor, immediately south of that is a major railway corridor with a lot of those, uh, those streams across by culverts and, um, and spillways that are perched. If you move out of their creek down into Lake Superior, you can't get back up because of those uh, barriers. So therefore, over time, you lose the coaster brook trout populations in those areas. It's a simple mechanical thing that can be fixed, but people don't necessarily want to spend the money. The other thing, of course, is increased sediment discharges from forest runoff and other sources, foul spawning areas, reduced bug densities, which your fish rely on for food, and they damage healthy channel structures and affect habitat. Also, a lot of the forest practices in the past uh, clear the repairing areas along streams, which also loosened the, uh, the banks and blew out the banks, which also led to degraded channels and habitat. And finally, a lot of the hydroelectric development dams create discontinuities, which means that the animals can't con connect to the headwaters and other areas for, uh, for reproduction or re refuge. And they also affect flow patterns. Over harvest is also an issue. And in some cases, it's the final straw that breaks the camel's back. It's sometimes not the first one. But also we have a, an attitude in the North that um, 
that the, the, the resource is there for harvest. And I don't blame them for that because it's been like that historically. But in some cases, for example, um, in a small lake system, if people with modern technology can go in with, uh, I, during ice fishing season, they can target those fish. And in one case in Eastern Ontario, in one day of, of, harvest, uh, har uh, of ice fishing, uh, four guys harvested uh, about a half a year's worth of um, lake trout production. In the South, we have a variety of things. Uh, first of all, the clearing of the land, of course, for tra traditional agriculture activities. We now have also non-traditional agricultural activities, um, production of uh, hemp, uh, uh, ginseng, uh, sod farms, all sorts of interesting things. We have issues related to point source pollution from urban uh, urban development, for example, uh, storm water, uh, wastewater treatment plants. We have uh, stormwater discharges as well. And then urbanization, which caps the landscape in, 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 in what we call an impervious surface. In other words, asphalt and concrete that prevents water from infiltrating into the soil. And then, of course, aggregate extraction. And it's not a coincidence <laughs> That if you want to find out where the good trout streams used to be, or some of them still exist, look at an aggregate map and look at where the most active aggregate extraction is. Of course, they're going to where there's the best gravel and sand and the best hills. And those areas, of course, used to have the highest groundwater discharge and the creeks adjacent to them used to be trout streams as a result of that. So uh, it's, it's a challenge. And then, of course, pond and dam building. We still have lots of people building on-stream ponds on cold water streams, which can warm up the creek and eliminate brook trout in those areas as well. So there's lots of things that are going on. I just wanted to give you an example of how much loss we've had in one watershed. This, for those that know watershed, watershed shapes, this is the credit. This is the Credit River watershed. I am, uh, let's see, I am somewhere right about here, right there in Georgetown, Ontario. Anyway, this is uh, the, this first map is a compilation of historical records, including old surveyors' notes from the 18, early 1800s about the distribution about where brook trout were found. So the green is where brook trout were found, I'm uh, saying the early 1800s. The red is where they no longer are found, and this is by the 50s, 1950s. This was the situation. By the 1980s, this was the situation, and by the year early 2000s, this was the situation. So you can see that we've lost a fair number. And for those that are in the and they're in the know, first of all, this is Black Creek that flows through Georgetown, and comes out of Acton. It still has brook trout, although many of its tributaries have lost those. This is the West Credit River, and this is the main credit here. So the West Credit is the last major bastion of brook trout populations left you know, on the Credit River watershed. And you can see that we have lost more than 80%. So what are the mechanisms driving population losses in the South? Or much of it has to do with the, uh, the use of the land. In the case of agriculture, we have sediment inputs, which uh, of course the farmers have to clear the land. They have to till the soil to plant seeds. But in many cases, when this, when, uh, we now have more and more farmers that are using no tillage practices, which are a good thing for, for our local water courses. But still, we get a lot of sediment discharge off those raw lands and also from urban development, major impacts from urban development. Even with, in theory, sediment fences, if they're not maintained during construction, they can put huge amounts of sediment into local receiving bodies very quickly and in a very short period of time. We also have tile drainage and agricultural drain maintenance, which means less deep infiltration of, of water into the ground and also potential lower groundwater recharge. We have changes in water quality and quantity, especially with extensive and intensive use of fertilizers, creating both surface water pollution with the heavy rainfalls, moving, those, moving soil particles and those chemicals into the water courses, and groundwater pollution. The groundwater pollution comes from nitrogen. If you don't have a high organic content in your topsoil in your farm field, you know, it doesn't capture the nitrate nitrogen and it so, starts to slope down into the deeper groundwater. And if the nitrate levels get high enough, it can cause a blue baby syndrome. Uh, that usually have, they have to be higher than 10 milligrams per liter in your water for, for to create a problem for children. 
but we do see some of that occurring still. And then there's the issue of pesticides, especially with neonics. Uh, we may be seeing another silent spring occurring as a result of that. For those of you that, uh, that, um, that monitor what I call the windshield, um, the windshield monitoring technique, if you can, re can you put your mind back to 20 years ago, driving through rural Southern Ontario in mid middle of summer, especially early in the evening, your, your, um, your wipers would be going and you'd be using up one hell of a lot of uh, windshield wiper fluid to get all that, uh, that uh, bug goop off your windscreen. Hell, I can go from, uh, from Georgetown, Ontario to Windsor and not have to put the, wind the uh, windshield wipers on at all and clean my windows from bugs now. So something has happened. And, uh, and for those of you that are birders, there's been a dramatic decrease in insectivorous birds in Southern Ontario. When you eliminate the uh, the prey uh, the uh, the food supply, you have fewer animals as well, and that goes all the way up the food chain. So, so you're getting the, the theme here that it's not just about trout. I think so. Sediment inputs and habitat loss, as an example, uh, are really important. Here's an example of a of a of a little stream after heavy rain in agricultural southern Ontario. And then, of course, you have marginal land being converted to cropland due to higher land and community and commodity costs, so you get more tile drainage. You also have cropping too close to stream banks, which uh, to maximize yields, but also increases potential for, um, for bank destabilization and, 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 and property loss. And there's a huge economic push for land drainage, which captures, which can then capture more sediment through greater surface runoff and higher peak flows. About 30 years ago, a whole bunch of us working in government were able to convince the farming community to start to allow um, what we call marginal land to go fallow and to put into conservation means. In other words, you got a bit of a, a, bit of a rebate on your taxes for leaving it uh, either as natural or uh, as fallow. And, the, and marginal land was land that you might only get a good crop every two to three years because it was either too wet, too close to the stream, too close to the wetland, are not easily drainable. With commodity prices going up, farmers are taking a chance that those lands can produce enough that make it worthwhile. So many of those, if not all of those lands that we had set aside along rivers and streams of wetlands are now being tiled. That is not a good thing. And unfortunately, this is going concurrent with the fact that there's virtually no oversight anymore by the Ministry of Agriculture and Food because they've been downsized, or concerns from MNR and MOE because they've been downsized. So mechanisms driving population losses in the South include the temperature change, which again, as I said, is driven by loss of canopy, loss of repairing areas, reduction in groundwater inputs, agricultural drain maintenance, as well as warm surface runoff. And of course, the one that's really adding to the, the mix is, um, is climate change. And for those that don't know why I have this picture in here, this little clump right here is a clump of about 300 brook trout sitting at a little, the main river here was flowing at 24 degrees centigrade, which is, it could kill them. And there's a little spring coming out here at 14 degrees and they were sitting in the, the no mixing zone of that little discharge. That was, that's their thermal refuge against high temperatures. That spring ever dried up, those brook trout would all die off. So one of the other mechanisms of loss, especially in urbanization, is impervious surfaces. That again, as I said, that's just a fancy word for things to stop water from infiltrating into the ground. And that means the loss of groundwater recharge. It means increased flooding. Uh, especially if you have a whole bunch of new homes in, uh, in marginal land that you're now going to build because you've changed the planning act. Uh, that also all those, those surfaces get really hot in the summer. And then if you have a heavy rain, it warms that, heats that water up so it's nice and hot and then puts it into your storm sewers and straight into your creeks. It's hot water. And then there's of course road salt in the winter and more chemical fertilizers coming from people that want a pristine lawn and don't want any little other plants other than uh, than uh, red fescue and uh, and um, and such. So these impervious surfaces create these type of mixes. Finally, you have disruption of conductivity. Here's an example of a perch culvert. 
animals can f swim down through that. It's pretty hard for them to get to, and most uh, fish can't jump that. And usually it's not, uh, they're too small to be able to jump it. So they are basically isolated from going upstream. And of course, as we work our way through this, urban, urban land use activities, activities have increased. And for a while there, back in the 90s, we were trying to intensify, and, and this is the conversation we had before we started, we were trying to build up in uh, municipalities rather than building out for many reasons, including loss of agriculture, and we didn't want to lose more agricultural land, and we also didn't want to have put more pressure on the natural environment. From, for doing all these types of activities. Of course, that's changed now we can build out. So urbanization tends to be the final major blow in trying to maintain healthy water resources and ultimately streams that, that are cold enough to support brook trout. And the key mechanisms of, of, the, of change in urbanization is that increased imperviousness, stormwater management, usually it's just enough stormwater management to slow the water down, drop the big solids out, hopefully cool it a little bit, and then let it flush. And growing out rather than up, and finally, wastewater treatment as well. Although wastewater treatment technology is improve, improving dramatically, there still is always a tipping point. And how much storm, wastewater can you put into a system before even the best designed wastewater treatment plant can no longer protect the local environment? All of these land use changes have potential consequences. They change water quality, they change quantity, they change the, ch the health, the structure of the channel through erosion and deposition. They change flooding characteristics and ultimately fish populations. Uh, I won't go into these too deeply, but all of these changes result in changes, that's delta change, changes in nutrient cycling, changes in channel morphology, changes in temperature regime and changes in habitat. And also, people don't think about where their water goes. You know, when the rain falls heavily on your municipality, where does the water go? Well, water it gathers in certain locations. It, can, it quite often in urban areas is caught into storm drains, which then go into, into uh, outlets into the local streams and bring all those nutrients and nutrients and sediments and water volumes into the system and create consequences whether it's massive algae blooms, which starve the rivers of oxygen and lakes of oxygen, or create blue-green algae explosions, um, which also are toxic to life. Increase flood conditions so that you have to, you think you're protecting people by building floodways until, they, until the floodway ends and then the consequences are for the people downstream. By the way, that's why you want a conservation authority. So municipalities upstream don't destroy the environment of, of, uh, of communities downstream at the, at the worst case scenario. And of course, higher erosion, and which affects channels and habitat as well. I call, I, and the trouble is that people only think of what's happening on the surface. A lot of things are happening under the surface. And here's, uh, I tried to explain this years ago saying, if you're looking at the top graphic, you've got this landscape You've got these blue things are actually just what I call aquitars. Maybe it's a clay lens. And this clear area here is gravels and sand. And maybe this underneath here is bedrock or a heavy till of some sort. So you get rainfall coming, you got depression storage and it, some of it infiltrates and go, this is actually the water table here. and goes through this stuff. Some of it runs off and then finds another area to soak in, creates a, a water table that has a gradient to it. The way you have reason you have groundwater popping out in the valley bottoms is it's running down a gradient that has pressure of all that water pushing downstream and then it pops out and creates healthy water bed or water or, or healthy streams. And then you develop, you put a house in here, you put some maybe a, 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 a septic system. Maybe you have a well here because it's, it's recharged. So you want to have a little bit of a well. Maybe you put a road surface and all of these things have an impact on how much water goes into the ground, how the quality of the water coming through, how much water is left after you drain it from a, through a pipe for water supply. And all that flattens the gradient of your water table, which means less groundwater activity and the stream starts to dry up and gets warmer. Again, this is out of sight, out of mind. This is why if you're looking at good planning, a watershed based management plan that understands these relationships and directs development in a way that doesn't affect these critical functions is why 
is the way to go. Many jurisdictions have moved in that direction. Ontario did too. And then we said, yeah, we've, we've been successful. We don't have to think about that anymore. I think Dennis O'Connor said that watershed planning was one of the best uh, planning methods to ensure healthy people and healthy environment. That was the Connor, the Connor Commission after the Walkerton crisis. So urbanization in many ways is the final frontier. It's the final kick at the cat. But usually by the time you're starting to urbanize, you're losing your, your brook trotter pretty well at the tail end. I'm seeing that in Georgetown here where they put some more developments in. They blew out the stream, this little creek that had an isolated brook trout population. They wiped the brook trout out. Now they're putting a new subdivision in and using traditional stormwater, which is starving the stream of any groundwater that had left. So I can't even restore it now because there's no groundwater to work with. But this is the circumstances over time. You, they start to urbanize and they, the stream starts to go up and down. It gets dirtier, starts to erode properties. People don't like their properties eroding. So they ask for the banks to be stabilized. And then the stream says, I have more water. I need a cross section to carry my water. I'll dig down deeper. And these things start to fall in. And then the result is the engineers say the only solution is to, is to armor the bed too. Uh, it was a guy by the name of Dr. Luna Leopold who was a professor of engineering and geophysics at, um, at the University of California at Berkeley, also the author of a book called Fluvial Processes in Geomorphology, who said that this is a logical progression based on a flawed premise. The flawed premise is we have to move all the water off the landscape as fast as humanly possible. And these are the consequences. So I said, we have to rethink our premise when it comes to how we engineer our watersheds. So then we have the wild card. We, it's not enough that humans have mucked up things locally. Now we have to muck things up uh, globally as well. And we're already seeing the consequence of climate change, which coincidentally, when people say, well, the models did, you know, your model is wrong because you said it would be this, this by such and such a date. The models are imperfect when it comes to time, but they're pretty damn good about what, you know, what will ultimately happen. So 30 years ago, when I first read my first set of um, um, papers on um, the modeling for potential climate change, it said, we're going to have higher variability. We're going to have hotter summers some, some years. We're going to have warmer winters. We're going to have more variable precipitation. And we'll have higher rate ratios of, of extremes, greater magnitudes of floods and greater magnitudes of droughts. So instead of the variance bouncing around a little bit, it's going to go wild and crazy. And that's exactly what we're seeing. So despite everything else, there are some landscapes that have the greatest chance of retaining brook trout populations in Ontario. I'm not to say that Southern Ontario can't, and I'll be talking about that in a moment. But for in the Northern Ontario, these are the major areas that all the modeling by good people like Dr. Mark Ridgway and others with the, the still work for the Ministry of Natural Resources as scientists, they say these are the three areas of the province where we're likely gonna see a good chance of keeping the brook trout populations fairly healthy. So those are the zones. Uh, I've I audited Southern Ontario. It's still possible to keep our brook trout in Southern Ontario in some of our streams. And I'll explain why in a moment. But these are the major areas. This is the, Algonqu uh, the Algonquin Highlands, the Algoma Highlands, and the Highlands around Nipigon. The reason that these areas north of the Shield are going to be challenging is because the brook trout do live up there, and there is a little bit of groundwater. Much of the cold water that they require is maintained by lakes that never get that warm, in the, even in the summertime, because they're so far north. However, as heat domes develop, those lakes that feed those rivers that still have brook trout that some of them are migratory and move out to James Bay and, and Hudson Bay, those, those streams are warming up. We're finding major impacts on the Sutton River because about two or three years ago, there was a huge, we had a huge heat spell up in the far north. The uh, Sutton Lake that feeds Sutton River got so warm that brook trout could survive in it. So, the areas that I've hi highlighted are areas that are topographically highest points in, in Ontario and still have a lot of gravel moraines and eskers, which also contribute groundwater. And that's why we're going that's where we're gonna see the greatest chance for survivorship. 
But what about the South? Is it still possible? It is because we have something that are groundwater generators. And those gray areas that you see are major groundwater generators. And you'll notice there's the Oak Ridge Moraine there. There's the flu gl glacial fluvial, that means glacier river outwash of the Grand River watershed and some other ones. There's the Norfolk Sand Plain down here. And these are the big outwash areas all around the Saugeen and Copeland Forest and so on in that area. So those areas still have it. Historically at where we found brook trout populations, this is a map that was done um, looking simply at physiography. So the light uh, colored and light colors are, are coarse textured soils. That means that these uh, so soils are gravel, sands, and coarse uh, and, um, and maybe cobbly areas. And again, you can see uh, the, the red dots are brook trout populations and they're dominated on the south side of the Oak Ridge Moraine, which is prim primarily outwashes of sands and gravels. Here they are on the, the gravel outwash areas of the Grand River, the Saugeen Highlands with the uh, ground, with the, uh, all the, uh, the gravel moraines, Copeland area and Norfolk Sand Plain. There are wild cards. There's, there's, there are brook trout populations along this rib. This is fine textured soil sitting on top of the Niagara escarpment. So the coarse texture soils generate groundwater. This does not generate groundwater, but it generates groundwater along the escarpment because the escarpment has something called secondary porosity. That means that you've got fractured dollastone, in other words, limestone, dollastone rock, that the water can infiltrate and then soak in and create aquifers and move water through the rock and then create cold water streams through this area here. There are a couple outliers here and outliers here. And we thought at first uh, that the modeling was going to somehow we, we found the exception to the rule until we looked at the local geology of those areas. And those all of those brook trout populations are associated with isolated large gravel eskers. So the big mounds of gravel sitting there that soak, the water soaks into the ground and pops out at the base of those eskers on, uh, where they're, they're sitting on the till plain and create cold water stream. So those are the areas of highest chance that protect and keep our brook trout populations left in Southern Ontario. And even here, looking at a simple at a landscape, you can see the density of gravels and sands in this part of the escarpment of the, of the Oak Ridge Moraine. And coincidentally, highest brook trout populations are come off out of those, uh, those um, moraines and those locations. So we have the chance to do a better job. We can, we have the tools. Wherever we have groundwater and we still maintain our groundwater resources, even if we buggered up the habitat, we can rebuild and bring brook trout back, especially in the South. But we have to have the will to do so and expertise and support. So we want to protect the best that still exist, and we want to restore and rehabilitate the rest. And ultimately, I just want to stress to people that we're not trying to save the planet. We're trying to save ourselves. Uh, James Lovelock, who um, wrote, who was popularized something called the Gaia hypothesis, he was a really good scientist, just passed away a few years ago, brilliant scientist, did a lot on the uh, sulfur cycle in the atmosphere and so on and so forth, and a lot of other things. But his 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 bottom line was, you know, if humanity through, through its screw ups of the environment kills itself off, the planet will be fine. It may take a few thousand years to clean itself up, to heal itself from our, uh, from our misuse of it, but it will persist and it will thrive. So ultimately, we're trying to save ourselves and our children and our grandchildren, which means we need to start to look at how do we work with development with land use activities to restore and rehabilitate what I consider to be the natural infrastructure, the health of our rivers, streams, our wetlands, our recharge areas, our moraines. We need to figure out how to do that a better job because we can have development in the right way, in the right, in the right spot with the right me mechanisms and, and, and development tools. We just need to do a better job. 
we all need clean water. We need clean air, clean air and wholesome food. And if the pandemic told us anything, we desperately need naturalness close by to keep ourselves sane. Even if people don't admit it, they need it. So clean water and wholesome food come from a healthy and functional landscape. And that, and ultimately, trout will come out of a healthy and functional landscape. So we need tools and on the ground work. So there's some good news stories. Just want to let you know. By the way, that's uh, uh, that's um, Ryan uh, Pizzacala, uh, who um, caught his biggest brook trout he's ever caught about a year and a half ago when we were fishing up and uh, on uh, on Lake Superior uh, at, um, at, uh, at 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 a camp. It, it was a beautiful brook trout. So some good news stories. Well, we are seeing the recovery and expansion of Nipigon Lake and Nipigon River brook trout populations and the recovering uh, of coastal brook trout populations in Lake Superior due in no small way to individuals within the ministry, within the Ministry of Natural Resources and the local anglers and local communities of uh, Nipigon and Red Rock. And the, the bio that led all of this was a good friend of mine, now Rob Swainson, and he should be canonized for the work he's done in bringing these beautiful animals back. As well, some of the m and biologists from long ago and still current, they're still working, have uh, been testing exceptional management approaches in the Algoma area, looking for what lakes and streams, and uh, just lakes and ponds that are are fishless because they're at a higher elevation, but cold enough to support brook trout and trying to look at adding and uh, adding more brook trout in, from hatch or from semi-wild hatchery stock to see if they can kickstart populations to add to the brook trout populations in those areas to increase the persistence of brookies in Algoma area. As well, uh, the Algonquin Park, uh, the Algonquin Park is now going through its uh, new fisheries management planning process to try to, with the number one task of preserving native animal populations within the park, of which the number one, co uh, one the number one fish that they want to protect and restore are brook trout, followed by lake trout. So, Al the, Al the, and that's thanks to the good people at the Ministry of, um, of Environment, Conservation and Parks who are spearheading that along with a bunch of advisory folk. And then also we've, we can, we've demonstrated that we can bring brook trout populations back in Southern Ontario. And I'll show you some of those examples in a minute. One of the tools that Trout Unlimited worked with, we worked with Trout Unlimited US on something called the Conservation Success Index. They use this um, in the Appalachia to look at the rest of the the tools that they needed to protect and restore damaged brook trout populations all through Appalachia, right up into Maine. We used um, their tool, their methodology, and their uh, their tools, and developed the CSI Conservation and Success Index approach that would work in Canada with the types of land coverage and um, overlays that we have and, and information that we had. So we recalibrated the, these tools and these GIS tools. We tested the approach on two water, two watersheds, the Credit, Val, Credit River watershed and Bronte Creek watersheds. The goal of this tool is to improve practical management and, as, and restoration and provide good information that can be embedded within watershed plans to guide where and how we develop in a way that complements protecting cold water resources while still allowing people a place to grow. So here's some of the mapping that comes out of it, looking at the, the total scores of health and productivity. One thing that comes clear is that this is the top end is still where we still have brook trout populations that desperately need protecting. So that's at this higher end. So those tools are there, whether they're used or not is another matter. Watership planning is a tool and more and more we're having a challenge with this current government to even think about doing anything like watershed planning anymore. Anyway, probably in part because they might tell them that they shouldn't do something in the place they want to do something, perhaps. I don't know, ignorance is bliss. But anyway, spawning bed enhancements have been, we've demonstrated that we can build spawning habitat for brook trout. This is an example, it's a small little creek near uh, Guelph. Uh, this is work done by um, Larry Halleck uh, when he was a stewardship uh, coordinator for Wellington. 
they went in, they found a seepage coming off this uh, off this land here. It was seeping mostly over land and warming up. So he actually worked with the landowner. They opened up this area, put a tile drain in this, closed it up so that the tile drain captures the groundwater. Then they built an upwelling box underneath this and then layered it with gravel. In other words, they created a brook trout upwelling area. Brookies love it. And since that, that time, that, that with the restoration of that, as well as the removal of a whole bunch of little mini ponds and dams on this particular creek, which is Marden Creek, we've now seen the resurgence of brook trout populations in Marden Creek after an absence of about 60 to 80 years. It can be done. Here's work that Trout Limited did on Brawny Creek, where we did restoration work in the uh, around 2010, 2011. Basically, this is in Lowville Park. It's being loved. The stream is loved to death. Everybody builds these little weirs. It's funny how they don't want you to move a park bench, but they allow people to go in and damage and destroy the, the banks of their stream that's on municipal property. Funny how that works. I don't understand. But anyway, they build these weirs thinking that they want to stop the water and build a pool. But if anybody thinks about a natural stream, stream, natural streams build pools by digging down. They don't build pools by building up. But we build up a dam. And then what happens is over time, the stream will move around, will, uh, during high flow, will push around these areas. It blows out the banks, makes the stream wider. And then they build a new, a new um, uh, weir and blow out the banks even further. And then they, add, they keep on building weirs further down and blowing. You can see these scallop margins are all old weirs. And so over time, they increase the width of that stream by 150% in about a 40 year period. So we went in to do both the rebuild riffles and pools and also work with natural materials narrow the channel down. And three years after we did all this work, we started in two separate years, we caught both the yearling and, uh, and, uh, and uh, two-year-old brook trout, which were the first brook trout that were recorded in over 35 years in this stream in this area. So it can be done. Did not chapter with support of the Isaac Walton Club, has done some uh, uh, great work on Mill Creek down near Tequanya, uh, where the this, this stream comes popping out of these blue holes, icy cold, eight degrees centigrade, and then flows in. There's, I think, about 15 or 20 of these little pothole springs, and then flows down. But it, the stream was damaged because of agricultural activity. So the chapter with Bill Christmas at the lead did enormous amounts of work. In seven years, they helped to restore the habitat to the point where it could sustain brook trout with over 3,000 hours of volunteer effort. And we finally selected one tributary to, to test whether or not we could bring reproduction back. That was Emerson Creek, it's a tributary of Mill Creek. And in the fall of 2015, we had 16 larger brook trout with tiny little tags put into them, transferred to Emerson Creek. And the result was that we had three reds in that area that fall. Uh, and we were able to account for 14 of the 16 fish released. Here, this the source of these brook trout were a, 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 a nearby cold water stream, Blair Creek, up near Cambridge. This is a bunch of us uh, collecting the fish, putting the little tags in them, allowing them to recover, and going to Emerson Creek after it had been done. We'd done restoration work, and putting the, the animals in there. And again, as I said, we started to see more and more brook trout reproduction. I haven't been there for a few years, but Apparently, the brookies are, are doing okay. It could probably use with another infusion in other sections of the, of the stream to bring the population up. But slowly but surely, we're bringing a trout stream back to an area that wasn't a trout stream probably 80 to 90 years. This is another stream that, although it's a spring creek, it was, again, loved to death, both by beavers and by loggers, and then by, by landowners who built undersized culverts. This is a, a stream was over wide and warmed up dramatically. We went in there, virtually all hand tools, and tightened the stream up, took out the, uh, the undersized culverts and put little mini uh, flatbed spans on them for the landowner. You might notice there's a few brookies swimming around. or well, maybe a few more. But 
the challenge we face right now is uh, one of the guys last week challenged me, said, what's the one takeaway message that you would suggest to our to our chapter or to our um, to our club? Now, I'm going to get to that in a moment. But I just want to say, OK, so how do we manage these resources? Well, the agencies, lands and waters before the Ministry of Natural Resources, I call it the um, the period between 1900 and 1978 was the time that we hewed the wood, we dammed the rivers, we stocked the fish and caught the poachers. That was primarily resource management at the time. Starting in 79, we became a science-based organization uh, because of the fine work of uh, Kevin, by, of Ken Loftus and others uh, in the Ministry of Natural Resources, who were excellent scientists, became director of fisheries who said, we need to do this in a science-based way. And between 79 and 95, we were one of the top resource agencies in North America for the type of work we were doing, with our focus on watersheds, wild fish, and habitat. Between 1995 and 2000, apparently we couldn't be number one because it cost too much money, so we were downsized. And a reduction of staff, redu reduction of capability and responsibilities, not just natural resources, the Ministry of the Environment, Ministry of Agricultural Food, and most recently, conservation authorities. So I would say that the transition was from, they told us to do more with less, then they were trying to tell us to do something with nothing, and now they're trying to tell us to do the minimum with no one. That is the sad state of affairs of environmental management in Ontario right now. And the reason that they got rid of the environmental commissioner in the first uh, term, was so that there was nobody to tell the public what was happening. Maybe I'm just being negative about that, but honestly, <laughs> that's the impression I get. Anyway, key questions concerning protecting and restoring our water resources, which ultimately look after our brook trout, is who's in charge of sound environmental and resource management in Ontario? Ask your local MPP. What agency is managing this critical ecosystem indicator of cold, clean water? You can ask them that too. And if they say they have regulations, then God help us. But they have the tools and staff be on the ground because environmental management cannot be done solely from a computer behind a desk. Are the NGOs expected, non-government organizations expected to carry the torch? They can help that they can't replace the hundreds upon hundreds, perhaps thousands, of biologists, scientists, planners, and others that have now been laid off in the last 10 to 15 years. And here's a sad, interesting fact, that if you were to combine the, the budgets of the Ministry of Natural Resources and, and Environment Conservation of Parks, what you'd find is that, that their total budgets make up less than one half of 1% uh, of the total provincial budget, and less each year. So the key takeaway, we want healthy environment, clean cold water, and as a result, brook trout, need to rebuild effective government agencies whose task is to work with private interests and the needs of the public to ensure the best outcomes for our environment and natural resources. Regulations are the last resort in natural resource and environmental management, but here we are until you demand better. In the future, ultimately, guys and gals, it's in our hands. We just have to recognize that it's in our hands. And that's it.